Okay, so yesterday we talked about how to build neural networks. We saw examples of that, and we saw also the ecosystem of frameworks like TensorFlow uh, with the API of Keras. Um, we did talk generally about you know, neural networks are these complex functions that we try to use to approximate uh, relationships that we have in the data. And then we talked about how we, um, we find the weights of those functions or we, how we optimize them. Uh, and we also mentioned how to monitor the learning process. We mentioned the difference between optimization and learning. Uh, our aim is really to generalize um, uh, the performance beyond the training data set that we're looking at. Um, today, we'll focus mostly on how we actually do that process in practice. How do we improve uh, the generalizability of uh, our network? So we'll talk about a few hairy issues uh, that uh, come in in practice. Um, I think if you remember, Brenda yesterday said that um, one thinks that uh, we spend most of our time trying to find the best architecture for the problem that we're working on, but that is really not not what we, yeah, we spend most of our time actually trying to make these networks work, um, even after you find that architecture, or you find some architecture that makes sense. You need to get it to work, and this is uh, not simple. Um, so before I get into uh, uh, the details, I wanna remind you again that um, uh, none of um, you know, events like this uh, are uh, sufficient to actually get a grasp on all the uh, nuts and bolts of actually doing deep learning in practice. Uh, I strongly recommend looking at an undergraduate level uh, course such as PS231 uh, um, and has great lectures. Um, and I'll be using a lot of these lectures. There are books on the market that also uh, are very helpful. There are academic books like the Deep Learning by Ian Goodfellow. Um, uh, uh, and this, I'm sure you have seen this uh, this book before. It's it is more of an academic nature, um, and there there are practical uh, books like Deep Learning with Python um, that Josh has also talked about yesterday. Um, okay, so why uh, why does it matter that we actually uh, get a grasp on how to train neural networks? Because we do think that the future will uh, uh, the future of software engineering will feature a lot of uh, deep learning and neural networks. Uh, we have already started seeing terms like software uh, 2.0, which is essentially building software that is powered by uh, neural networks. We talk about uh, deep learning based systems uh, where uh, you have your entire pipeline of software or entire stack uh, composed of multiple parts and those multiple parts, many of them are neural networks. Um, so we do expect that in the future, we want to actually be able to to have a development cycle um, that is um, uh, that's a disciplined development cycle for for this uh, software, um, this type of, of uh, this type of software. So, what characterizes software 2.0? It's essentially uh, the fact that we use. Uh, it's a, okay, let's step back and think of what software 1.0 is. Uh, we always talk about this rule-based sort of software, right? You have all learned uh, F. Uh, else uh, for loops and uh, recursion and all that sort of uh, algorithms that we use uh, to build traditional uh, software. So, and the, the way that we achieve tasks we're using traditional software is we think about the actual problem that we're looking, uh, we're looking at that we're trying to solve, and then we come up with an algorithm. We can even write a flow chart for that algorithm, and that flow chart is rule-based, right? Um, there's a, deep learning provides a different way of, uh, of building software. Uh, and that way is, uh, let's collect some data uh, where in that data it exhibits the, the sort of relationship or the task that um, we want to achieve. And then we use gradient descent uh, to find the best software or the best uh, version of that model that can achieve the task that we're looking at. Uh, so if you're looking at an optimization space of software like this, this would be software 2.0. You just come up with an algorithm, one point, uh, software 2.0, you start uh, with uh, at some point and then you use gradient descent to do an optimization process um, to, to get to the software that you want. We can actually achieve much higher complexity uh, uh, software. You've already seen a lot of tasks yesterday that were displayed that are extremely difficult to actually come up with uh, algorithms to do 
um, um, to do those tasks or perform those tasks with a rule-based filter software. Um, uh, and as Andrew Karpatsky says, gradient descent can really write code uh, better than you do. Okay, so how do we do this in practice? Um, you've seen uh, XKCD like this. It goes like, oh, this is your machine learning system. Yup, you pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra, then collect the answers on the other side. What if the answers are wrong? Uh, just stir the pile until they start <laughs> making sense. Okay, so uh, it's, of course, this is, you know, kindly facetious, but uh, in practice, we, you know, we need to do a lot of stirring, but this stirring is not, uh, is not easy. You will see a lot of these issues uh, today. This is what we're gonna talk about. So, I'll talk about data normalization briefly. Uh, this is an important topic that sometimes is necessary. We'll talk about learning grade decay, uh, and then we'll spend some time talking about regularization. Uh, after that, uh, I'll, I'll move on to talking about uh, depth. Um, and then I'll try to finish with a couple of uh, things that are uh, um, we use in, in practice, things like transfer learning uh, and some practical tips. I hope I can get through all the slides. So normalization. Um, I think this has been mentioned yesterday a couple of times, and you've also seen it in, uh, in the practical sessions um, that we usually um, normalize uh, the data set the, the features of the data set. And the idea is that um, the, uh, the, the different features that you have in your data set could have artificial uh, scales that you don't want your neural network or your model to spend time trying to figure out what scale uh, this feature is, especially if the scale is irrelevant. Actually, yes, and most importantly, if the scale is irrelevant. Uh, so if you're looking at data like this, one way of uh, doing um, uh, normalization is to move your di the distribution of your data, um, uh, the mean of that distribution to zero, zero, and also maybe divide by the standard deviation to standardize or to normalize the different uh, dimensions. It's important to remember that you don't really need to do this all the time. You only need to do it if you have reasons to believe that uh, the different uh, dimensions, the scales of the different dimensions do not, um, uh, are not important uh, to, your, uh, to your algorithm. Or if these two dimensions, for example, are equally important, you think that these features are important. Otherwise, you don't need to do, uh, to do this. You have to think about your problem. Um, a different way of, of doing normal, there are a lot of ways to do normalization and it really depends on what you're looking at. Um, uh, and uh, so, for example, another way of doing it is what we call whitening the data set is essentially find the eigenvalues, of, uh, the eigenvectors of your distribution, uh, do a transformation by that uh, uh, to, to a diagonal matrix, put your data on essentially uh, on the eigenvectors, um, and then normalize, and then you'll get a whitened data. There are a lot of, uh, a lot of normalization methods that um, uh, you need to look at, but you really need to think about the data set that you're dealing with. Okay, I'm gonna move on to a, uh, Slightly uh, different topic, uh, weight initialization. I didn't mention this yesterday. Kind of thought that it's uh, implicit that when we start our neural network, we start with random weights. The weights of our uh, neural network are completely random, but how do we choose that initialization? Uh, first of all, if we don't initialize them at all, we know that there is no learning, right? Like if the, all the weights are zero, you can think about it a little bit and look at the gradient descent, you realize that there will be no updates whatsoever. If I initialize all of them to with a constant value, all of there is no symmetry. All of them will be learning, ex receiving exactly the same uh, gradient update and we're not gonna get anywhere, right? So we need to break that symmetry with some distribution. The first thought is to use a normal distribution, right? Like just initialize them with, with uh, some constant um, uh, standard deviation um, and just use a normal distribution. This is, uh, this is okay, it works for, um, for narrow or for shallow uh, neural networks. Um, however, uh, it turns out that if you use, um, um, uh, if you use that in deeper neural networks, uh, you tend to, the activations tend to, uh, to go to, uh, to zero mean. I think it's also easy if you just look at, the, uh, you know, with a pencil and paper, uh, look at this. If you start with, uh, if you initialize, for example, with normal distribution, with 1% sort of um, 
uh, standard deviation, the activations of your first layer are gonna look like this. Activations of the second layer are gonna be a little bit narrower. As you go <coughs> deeper, by the time you get to the sixth layer, you're already at 0.05 standard deviation of the activations. Um, and as we talked about yesterday, uh, the activation is going to zero. Uh, that means that the gradients would also go to zero because we're applying the chain rule, right? Uh, uh, pro back propagation. Uh, and this is not a good idea. This is not gonna work because you're gonna kill the learning very early on. Okay. Um, what if I start with a larger standard deviation? Uh, maybe that would be a solution, uh, but it turns out that it's not because also the activations tend to, um, uh, to also get uh, saturate uh, to minus one and one. This is, by the way, this is with a sigmoid activation. This is a neural network with a sigmoid activation. You can see that it goes to minus one and one. Uh, but also, it's just, just to illustrate the idea that even going with a larger standard deviation for the normal distribution does not get us anywhere. We get into other sorts of problems. So here, the uh, problem is saturation, and you also get uh, zero uh, gradients actually almost everywhere. So this doesn't work. How do we get around this? Uh, there are all sorts of initialization uh, methods uh, that we have or algorithms that people came up with. Um, thinking about uh, things a little bit about the number of um, uh, uh, the input um, uh, neuron or the number of input connections to a neuron and the number of output connections and how do we need to weight those so that uh, uh, the activations have a separate distribution along the entire depth um, is something that was done by Gloris and Zia um, So they came up with what we call the Gloris uh, distribution, also called the Zavier uh, distribution, um, initialization, which is essentially says use a normal distribution with one over square root of the number of input uh, dimensions. And as you can see, it gets rid of the problem of these uh, zero activations or uh, narrowing uh, activations. Uh, so we get around this and then we can learn things are fine, but this works really well with the uh, sigmoid activations. It turns out that it has a problem with um, uh, ReLU uh, networks and uh, networks that have ReLU activations. You uh, get into the math, uh, you look a little bit uh, at uh, um, networks with ReLU activations. Um, it's actually very easy to follow the math in, in this paper. Uh, and I forgot the citation for the paper, but it's essentially by uh, Kaming, uh, he and, uh, and others. Um, they show that uh, for uh, ReLU activated networks, um, the Xavier initialization um, tends to also have a problem with, uh, with learning. Uh, so you'll get this sort of error, it just saturates, um, and you actually don't get anywhere. Mm -hmm. So you would need to use uh, the Kaming, he. In most of frameworks, this would be the called P initialization. Uh, so you need to look at this. Um, DN is the number of input uh, uh, connections to the neuron. Um, and this would depend on if you're doing, this is, if you're doing a fully connected, this would be just the number of input neurons. If you're using a convolutional uh, uh, kernel, uh, that would be the number of uh, the K by K, the kernel size by the number of channels. Um, I didn't want to get to all the math here, just wanted to give the big picture. Um, but then you see, like, as soon as you switch to the he initialization, you actually uh, start, uh, you know, the network starts learning. There was a blog post, I think I saw it last week. Uh, somebody was um, uh, pointed out that the default uh, initializer in uh, Keras uh, is actually Xavier initialization. So as soon as you get to a few layers, uh, with ReLU networks, it's the network stops learning. Um, so you need to pay attention that there are uh, default values for all of these things in your uh, framework, especially Keras, it kind of assumes uh, stuff. Uh, so you need to actually g pay attention to what is going on because this can be frustrating. You can spend a lot of time not realizing that it's assuming some initializer. Yeah, I, I can see that, sorry. Yeah, please. This is the, uh, the, I think this is the validation error, but it could be the training error, I'm not sure. The idea is that it actually, the, the updates, the, you stop getting updates to the network at all, uh, to the weight, so it stops learning. Uh, it's just this, the, the two. <laughs> it makes a difference, yes, yeah. I, I suggest you also look at the, uh, uh, at the paper. I think uh, the math is very easy to follow there. I think, 
I, I'm not sure, but I, I think this happens with like a, a 10 layers of network, you would immediately start seeing this. Um, I don't think that this is ResNet or anything like that, but I, I, I could be wrong. Okay, I think this actually came before ResNet, uh, the, this paper, by the same people who came up with ResNet. Okay, so um, one thing about initialization is that we tend to think, okay, that problem has been solved. Okay, things are fine. It's been solved since 2010 or something, and we're moving on. However, um, it turns out that uh, initialization is way more tricky uh, than just that. So there is a series of recent papers that explore essentially the effect of initialization on the performance uh, on, uh, of the network and the relationship between initialization and generalization and all of that. So. I'm gonna try to, this is a, a recent paper last year and there's a lot of work, follow-up work this year, um, and try to uh, give a very high level overview of what is going on here. So uh, the basic idea is that when we build these very big networks um, and train them, get a very nice error, um, and then we want to take them and go and apply them in practice, deploy them in practice, we apply, we want something that is smaller. We want a network that is much smaller than that because it's much easier to, um, uh, to, to they're much faster to, uh, to, to use in inference mode. Uh, and also we know that if we look at all the neurons in the network, we know that a lot of those neurons after the, the training finishes, a lot of these neurons are not necessary. Uh, so they're dead already and they're not really doing anything. So we apply something called pruning. Um, so essentially, we take uh, the original network after full training, and then we prune it, and we get a network like this that performs equally well to the, um, to the initial network. So the question that uh, these authors have uh, explored is that why can't we just start with that pruned network and with exactly the same initialization that we received in the first time um, and see where we get? Can we actually get the same performance? And the uh, answer is yes. It turns out that you can get the same performance if you start with the pruned network and with exactly the same initialization that we had before. Um, there is, um, uh, they call it the lottery ticket hypothesis. And uh, the idea is that uh, after you finish, you're going, your uh, uh, idea is that you're initializing your network and we have these extremely big networks with so many neurons because we're trying to explore as much um, uh, initialization, as much an exponential number of sub-networks, uh, essentially. Uh, and then uh, there is a lottery ticket. There is one of them that actually ends up being uh, the network that, that works when you're uh, doing inference using the full network. Um, and uh, this is an important idea because it could be, the, essentially it's pointing the, to the, um, the possibility that, uh, it could be that we are building these extremely large networks because we have very bad initialization. And if we figure out how to initialize our networks better, uh, we might be able to build much smaller networks to achieve the same performance um, on um, uh, the task that we're looking at. There is um, a recent paper uh, actually, I think, yeah, this is June, yeah, June last, last month, um, uh, where essentially they explored this, uh, this same idea. They, they, took a network, they took a network, they initialized it, and then pruned, and then they look, used the same initialization to initialize so many other networks and see if that, that set of initial parameters generalize and also help us train other networks uh, to get the same performance. Um, I encourage you to look at this paper, it's very interesting, but more importantly is that um, this is an active area of research. Um, it's, it's possible that uh, within the upcoming um, uh, months to a couple of years that we figure out a way to initialize our networks better and then we can build uh, smaller networks to perform the same tasks, yes. Um, I'm not an expert on that, so I haven't done a lot of uh, that, but my, I think uh, most of what they do is uh, they look at uh, the effect of um, the participation of certain neurons in the final decision on the accuracy of the network. If, uh, if killing a, a connection does not affect um, uh, the final uh, performance, then that connection is not necessary. Uh, so you essentially remove it. 
Yeah, so this is exactly what this uh, paper is uh, doing. So we found that within the natural images domain, winning ticket initialization generalized across a variety of data sets, including blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then uh, moreover, winning tickets generated using larger data sets consistently transferred better than those generated using smaller data sets. Um, actually, one of the authors is Michaela. She's one of the organizers, I think. She will be here today, so uh, you can also talk to her about this. So this is this is at least the the paper. The case study was on image classification. Okay, so initialization is not is not uh, simple. You need to think about the default parameters that you have in your network, uh, and uh, soon we might it's it's possible we might find a way to have better initializations for our networks. If we start with good parameters, we might be able to converge much faster to um, good performing uh, model. Okay, I'm gonna move on to talk about a different topic, um, which is uh, learning rate uh, decay. So uh, if you're, when you think of um, 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 gradient descent, we are, we're always like the, the picture of gradient descent is that we're using these, uh, uh, the gradient information to try to get to a point that, is, that, minimi that what we call a minimizer, right? A point at which the loss function uh, is low. We expect what's a minimizer, at least in the classic uh, picture in the convex optimization picture, um, the minimizer is a place where, um, uh, where uh, essentially uh, the loss surface is flat, right? So that means the, um, uh, the slope is it tends to go to zero. Um, if you so, uh, but remember that we are using stochastic gradient descent. So even if the gradient itself, the full gradient is, we are getting closer to a minimizer, and the full gradient is getting uh, having us, you know, uh, getting to zero. Uh, so it's decaying itself. Um, but uh, stochastic gradient descent has a lot of noise, right? Because of the stochasticity of the batch, the random batch that we're getting taken from one point to another. So uh, we, need to, we need to emulate that sort of um, um, effect of having a decaying uh, slope. And um, um, there, are, there is a, some result that shows that um, if you want to use uh, uh, SJD, uh, it's sufficient uh, if these conditions are satisfied. Um, so epsilon here is the learning rate, um, and the conditions are, the first one says that uh, the sum of the learning rate along all the steps, or the sum of the size of the steps along my optimization uh, equals infinity, um, and uh, the sum of the squares of those steps or the magnitudes, uh, the squared magnitudes of those steps uh, uh, is finite. Intuitively, the first result says that if, the, if I start from a completely random uh, initialization point, it's in the middle of nowhere, uh, uh, with the number of steps that I am taking, I'm guaranteed that I can reach the minimizer wherever it is. I have infinite range to get to it, right? Um, the second result intuitively uh, says that if I get close, uh, I will be able to converge to that point. I'm not gonna uh, just be, um, um, you know, uh, swinging around that point. So I'll be able to converge uh, to that point. So how do I achieve this in practice with SGD? We do learning rate decay. So essentially we decay what we call decaying the learning rate as we are uh, going uh, on. So uh, um, in practice, you will hear about something called the learning rate schedule, and that's what you will be uh, using and, and thinking about. There are a lot of different types of learning rate schedules. Uh, people use linear decay. Uh, or exponential decay, or cosine, or inverse square root, whatever it is. Um, and this is usually as a function of the step, uh, more often as a function of the epoch, the number of passes that you have uh, through your data. So for example, um, linear decay would be, uh, you have a, an initial learning rate multiplied by uh, one minus t, which is the, the epoch number, divided by the total number of epochs. Um, and you control this by thinking about what's the final um, learning rate that you'd have, and you see that this is a decaying uh, function. <laughs> so the basic idea, which Josh also touched on this yesterday, is that the networks that we are looking at, we're not trying to get to a global minima. There, are, there is an, a large number of good minimizers of the entire loss function on that data set. Uh, so there is an abundance of minimas that are equally good. And there are results showing that those numbers are all actually within 
good performance. So whatever you get to, whatever minimizer you get to, that's good enough. You just don't want to get stuck in an extremely bad one very early on. So you don't decay too fast. Now, a more practical way of doing this, which is, touches on your point, is to actually, instead of trying to a priori decide how you want to decay your learning rate, you can use, um, you can monitor your loss function or you monitor the performance on some uh, validation data set and only de reduce the learning rate when you get to, when you stop learning with the current learning rate. So if the loss here tends to get to almost zero slope, um, you reduce the learning rate. If you get to another plateau, reduce the learning rate. Um, this is actually uh, uh, the plot of uh, the training uh, ResNet. Um, and the, the decay here is by a factor of 10. So they divide by 10 at each point of the learning rate. Um, there is, uh, in, in the frameworks that you use, especially Keras, uh, there are stuff called like reduced learning rate on plateau. This is a callback that you can add, and then you can decide uh, what's the patience, which is patience here would be the number of epochs that you would wait for before you decide to, to decay the learning rate. So here, for example, this, it hasn't been decayed immediately. So you waited uh, more than 15 epochs or 20 epochs here, um, or, yeah, to, and then you decayed. So you can apply, put your patients, you can have the minimum learning rate, you don't want to reduce beyond that, and you can also have the decay factor that you can use. I think this is a more practical way of uh, doing um, uh, learning rate decay, unless, until uh, uh, somebody shows that this is um, a bad idea. Uh, and I'm sure somebody will. So maybe, yes. Yeah, that's actually a, 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 very, um, uh, a very important paper. And um, um, I think we'll talk more about that paper on Friday uh, during the scaling, uh, um, deep training deep learning models at scale. Um, the, the basic gist of, of that paper is that uh, uh, it turned out that the more complex the data set that we're applying, uh, we're, we're applying our models on, and the more complex the, the models themselves, um, the, uh, uh, the larger the batch size that you can actually use, and that uh, having a larger batch size helps you uh, parallelize your, the optimization of your model and all those sort of stuff. Um, so, and this is, I was about to mention that uh, another way to, to do things is I, rather than decaying the learning rate, um, you can, if you look at the relationship between the learning rate and the batch size that you're using, remember that we're trying to reduce the learning rate because we're trying to counteract the, uh, uh, the, the, the noise. We're annealing essentially the noise that we have in the stochastic gradient descent. Um, and uh, one way to do this is instead, of, uh, is instead of decaying the learning rate itself, we decide that, okay, let's just uh, increase the batch size. There's a bunch of papers uh, that explore this idea. One of them is with a very interesting title, Don't Decay the Learning Rate, Increase the Batch Size. Um, and they show exactly this. Instead of um, lowering, um, uh, decaying the learning rate, uh, they actually show that decaying the learning rate or increasing the batch size, you can achieve almost exactly uh, the same loss, uh, the loss curve or training curve. And they even have a hybrid approach where um, they're decaying the learning rate while increasing the batch size, and they can achieve the same thing. If you uh, do this delicately, uh, you can achieve the same thing. Um, and uh, the paper that you mentioned uh, by uh, um, uh, OpenAI explores this idea further and actually derives a lot of relationships between batch size learning rate um, uh, and uh, uh, the optimization progress. Uh, that's a good question. So the basic idea is that if, you're, if you want to decay, we're trying to reduce anneal the noise, right? So we can decay the learning rate. But if I increase the batch size instead, I can parallelize my process and train faster. So um, if my batch size, uh, I go from batch size, uh, whatever, 10 to 100, I can, instead of using a GPU, I can use 10 GPUs at a time, and then I finish the training faster. So it's, it's about the wall, wall clock time, finishing the training faster. Thanks for the question. Other questions? Okay. So, uh, now we're gonna move on to talk about regularization. So you remember yesterday we said that uh, uh, if we monitor the training error and we monitor the validation error, 
there are uh, multiple regions and we said that we want to get out of underfitting as soon as possible um, and this uh, this is usually easy to get out of uh, there are multiple ways of of doing this can um, yeah so uh, and then we spend most of our time in this regime where we're trying to essentially push this point along as much as possible where uh, we're trying to reduce the error on um, uh, an unseen data set or the validation data set. We talked about the generalization gap. So how do we do this in practice? Um, we use regularization. So uh, this is um, uh, the loss function. Uh, this is the, uh, the, uh, the loss function that we have on a, uh, on a mini batch, right? This is what we said we're trying uh, to have, um, uh, essentially trying to fit, uh, to have a, the, the loss function is trying to, is targeting um, uh, uh, the data set. We're trying to fit very well uh, to the data set. You could have a label here Y if, um, if you're dealing with a supervised learning setup, and this is on a mini batch. So what we do is we add a regularizer to the, to the loss function. Um, and um, so the regularizer is usually in this form. So you have some penalty on the norms of the weights. Um, and the job of this is to essentially say, like, don't fit too well to the training data. It's just we, want, we don't want to overfit to the training uh, data itself. Um, there are many ways of thinking about this, and this is not special to uh, neural networks or, or deep learning. So this is in the context of statistical learning uh, in general. Um, and it could, you can think of it as a way of, uh, of choosing a simpler hypothesis uh, uh, than an, uh, an extremely complicated hypothesis that, that overfits the, um, uh, the training data very well. So a few terms, this lambda is usually the strength, of, uh, uh, the lambda coefficient is the strength of the regularizer, uh, which you want to tune as well as it's a hyperparameter. The weights, the, the, the penalty that you apply is applied on the weights, not the biases. Uh, the rationale is that we have two, two, um, a small number of biases anyway, we don't really need to regularize those. Um, and then we need the biases to be free because if there are any shifts in the activations or the data, we want to be able to get those. And in practice, if you try to, um, to regularize the biases, uh, you tend to underfit uh, your, your training data anyway. So um, types of regularizers, I'm gonna go and talk about these in, some of these in detail, but just an overview of things. Um, you probably have seen an L1, um, uh, or L2 regularizers. Um, so L1, essentially you add to the loss function the sum of uh, uh, the absolute value of the weights. And this tends to create sparse representations, um, um, which assumes that if you, if you have reasons to believe that your activations uh, should be sparse, or if you tried it and it turns to work out well, um, then um, uh, this is the thing to use. Um, you can, it's, it's easy to think of why this creates a sparse, uh, sparse representations. Uh, the penalty here is on the size of the weights themselves, right? Whether the weight is one or 10, it's penalized. If it's not zero, it's penalized. So it actually is trying to force the network to learn uh, a sparse representation. Only have a non-zero weight if you have reasons to believe that this is helping the optimization, right? Another type of regularization, which you see this more often, uh, sometimes it's called the weight decay, um, is you add to the loss function, um, uh, essentially um, uh, the norm uh, of, of your weights. And this is a, a different type of uh, regularizer. It says only like don't have too large weights, right? This is, if it's small, it's not, the penalty is not that strong, but if W is very high, the penalty is strong. There are a lot of connections to uh, Bayesian optimization. If uh, essentially it could act, if you, you can think of this as um, a Gaussian prior on the weights, you have reason to believe that your weights are Gaussian or, or uh, normally distributed. Um, so the log of a Gaussian gives you W squared. Um, this, in practice, we tend to use uh, L2 a lot. Uh, other types of regularization, things like uh, noise robustness, uh, you want your network to not be too sensitive to the size of, uh, to, to, to the weight, the value of the weights themselves. So you add some noise uh, to the weights. So you want the decision to be independent of small uh, 
perturbations uh, to the waste that you have. This is another type of uh, regularization. I'll talk about early stopping, dropout, normalization. Uh, adversarial training is something that we're not gonna get into, uh, but you have seen a glimpse of this in Josh's talk yesterday. Um, um, and it's also a form of um, uh, regularization that, uh, that tries to counteract this problem of adversarial uh, examples. Uh, and you will see more, we have been seeing more and more of this in practice that uh, we try, for many reasons, for improving the generalization of our networks and also for uh, counteracting this, this problem of uh, uh, adversarial attacks for security reasons. I'm sure you will hear more about this during the week. Okay, so, yes. Early stopping, uh, we mentioned yesterday that early stopping is something that you want to apply all the time. Uh, so essentially you monitor your validation error and as soon as your validation error starts climbing, that's where you want to stop because this is where uh, your model has the best performance. Um, and this is, it's a type of regularization. You can see, if you look at uh, Ian Goodfellow's book, you'll see a connection between early stopping under, in some uh, simplified setup, early stopping and L2 regularization. Um, so essentially early stopping, the way that you can think about it, like L2 says like, don't wander too, too far off from the initial uh, parameters. Um, yeah, so this is something that, a type of regularization they use in practice. Dropout, you have seen this in the networks yesterday. Uh, the basic idea of dropout is the following. We have, this is a fully connected network and this is what we're training. Um, uh, there is, the, the idea of dropout is to randomly drop connections uh, while you're doing the training uh, of your network. And uh, the basic idea is that maybe if I randomly uh, drop these connections, uh, I will uh, discourage the network from uh, having a cohabitation. Some neurons fire only when the other neurons are firing. I can also make, uh, again, these are all intuitive pictures that are helpful, but they break sometimes. So uh, another way of thinking about it is that you're forcing the network to not to rely too much on certain representations to be able to make its decision, right? So uh, you're forcing it to rely on multiple sort of um, um, uh, representations to be able to reach the same, uh, the same decision. And what you do is that in, uh, um, at inference time, you use the full network and then you can look at the math a little bit and then uh, you, will, um, uh, you can um, uh, reba rebalance or, or renormalize uh, the output so that you uh, essentially cancel out the, 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 this probability of dropping the network uh, connections. Um, another way to think about this is that you're continue, you're training instead of one network, you're training a large ensemble, an exponentially large ensemble uh, of networks, right? When I have random uh, dropping out uh, connections all the way uh, through my network, I'm, I have a, a random ensemble. Every time I'm training a different uh, sub-network. Uh, in practice, this tends to work really well. Uh, so you see with the, this is uh, the loss function of training a certain network uh, without dropout. This is with dropout. Uh, you can see how it improves the, uh, the class, it reduces the classification uh, error. Where do you insert dropout? Yes. Yeah, yeah that's, that's exactly how you should do it. So essentially when um, um, you want to, you want to average, so you're training these sub-networks, right? Uh, but at the inference time, you want to average the decision of all this ensemble of sub-networks, uh, right? So you need to um, uh, cancel out that dropout probability that you have. So if you're dropping out to probability 30%, uh, you want to actually rebalance the output. I didn't, I didn't uh, put the math here because I wanted to get through more slides, but uh, you wanna pay, actually that's a good point. You want to pay attention to that when you're doing when you're building your network that sometimes you would get different results and when you have dropout and if you don't pay attention to what you're, you're, you're doing um, or you're using uh, the dropout layer uh, in inference, in, in training mode, uh, you will get a different result that when you're using it in training mode and this is essentially for this rebalancing of the probability. Yeah, thank you. It, it could very well be that if you train a network without dropout, um, you will get more, net, more neurons would die. But if you train it with dropout, uh, you will get more neurons who would actually stay alive and then your pruned network would be smaller. Um, it could be very well be, but 
Yeah. So uh, I, I see your point. They might, there might be a connection. That's a good question. So uh, that was my next slide, uh, where I do think that uh, dropout is not necessary in, the, uh, in between the convolutional layers, because there are, we're trying to learn um, uh, filters and feature extractors, um, uh, and they usually have much less number of parameters than the dense layers. Um, so I, I think that it doesn't make a lot of sense uh, to, to do drop, to apply dropout there. Uh, and I put here an example of one possible way of putting dropout is look only at the classifier or the last uh, dense layers and you put some dropout in there. That said, it might be that if you put dropout in your network, it might perform better. I haven't seen a lot of results on that. Is this idea clear that where to put the dropout? Not clear. Okay, so um, another form of uh, regularization is data augmentation. So we mentioned yesterday that the best way to improve the performance of your network is to collect more data, right? Uh, if you can do that, that's awesome. Uh, if you can't do that, or even if you can do that, you might still want to also apply some sort of data augmentation. Um, when we are applying, let's think of the context of object recognition. When we are applying neural networks or convolution neural networks on, for ob object recognition, we know that uh, the decision of the network should be independent or invariant uh, of the orientation, for example, of the objects or the color, the hue of the objects or, uh, or whatever sort of uh, transformation mirroring the, uh, the objects, we should get the cat should still be the same cat, right? Um, so one way of forcing the network to learn that is to augment the data set by applying these transformations randomly on the original uh, data set as I am training. Um, of course, you don't want to apply that during uh, the test or uh, validation, but uh, during training, this is uh, what you do. And it tends, this is something that we do a lot in practice and it improves um, the performance um, uh, of the network. Uh, of all the models, uh, you want to make sure that uh, whatever transformations that you're applying actually make sense for your network. Increase the size of the training data set. Oh, you can't see it? This is a Z. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Thanks. Thanks. Um, okay. So, um, um, so this, this is uh, something that you can do um, if you're looking at the tf.data.dataset, uh, this uh, uh, data ingestion pipeline that comes with TensorFlow. Uh, we usually do these transformations on the fly uh, in that pipeline. If you have a very large uh, set of, you're doing um, a training of an extremely large model and you have a lot of uh, workers doing the, uh, the, the data shuffling and the data ingestion and all of that sort of stuff, uh, you'll also want to get them busy doing uh, data augmentation. Okay, um, another type of um, uh, regularization, this time is different, is a little bit different. Um, it's, uh, there are a lot of things that we do uh, to help the performer, to help the, uh, to make the optimization process easier while we're training neural networks. Um, and some of them, they end up being uh, implicit regularizers. Uh, there is some contention about the word implicit here, but they are not explicit as in, they're not just added to the loss function. Uh, one of them is called batch normalization. The essential idea of batch normalization is that, uh, look at this network. Um, you have a hidden layer, a hidden layer gives some activations, the activations go into the next layer. Um, the, the main idea was that if, um, if I am updating two, the both layers at the same time, uh, this layer is being updated to respond uh, to, the, to the current gradients, uh, but by the time, once I update this, uh, uh, this layer, I'm also updating the previous layer. Once I update the previous layer, the activation of the previous, previous layer are shifting. Um, so once they shift, then this has to relearn um, how to respond to the new activations. This picture is kind of, uh, the, the basic idea that people, you know, have been thinking about when they came up with batch normalization. There are a lot of um, uh, reasons or recent work to believe that that is not exactly how batch normalization helps. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about this, but that's, that was the initial idea. You can think about it from a different point of view. We talked about normalizing the input to the entire network. Um, the batch normalization tries to normalize the activations themselves. So every one of these layers receive 
um, the same distribution of data uh, rather than just the very first layer where, where, where it receives some, uh, some normalized data. Uh, the way that you do this, this is directly from the original batch normalization paper, um, is that uh, you take the sum along the batch, uh, and then you, you, may, you essentially get the mean along the batch, you get the standard deviation along the batch, and then you normalize the activations uh, of the layer by subtracting the mean and dividing by um, uh, the standard deviation plus an epsilon for numerical stability. Um, and this is great, this normalizes the outputs of every layer, uh, however, what if the, that you know, severely restricts the capacity of the network and the capacity doesn't really want a completely normalized distribution? Uh, so you allow for those shifts by having learnable parameters, gamma and beta, uh, so to rescaling uh, the, uh, essentially the activations by gamma and beta, and gamma and beta are learnable parameters. So you actually update those with gradient descent. I think it will depend on the problem that you're looking at. A lot of uh, people, they do augmentation by doing random crops and then generating texture around the random crops and they, uh, that works for, for the problem that they're looking at. Um, yeah, if it doesn't make sense for your day, you should definitely, you're teaching the, the, your model the wrong thing, right? You want it to, in your case, you want it to make sense of the order. You actually wanted to use that information as, as a clue to what is going on. If you're removing that, then you're removing an important feature from your data. You want, don't want to break essential features in your, uh, in your data or essential correlations in your data. Okay, so um, batch normalization. Um, so in practice, uh, it helps with a lot of things. First of all, um, you remember the problem of uh, vanishing gradients that we talked about when we build deeper networks. Um, essentially, we have, um, um, uh, when we multiply gradients along uh, the layers, uh, the, the gradients tend to vanish by the time they come to the very early part of the network. We'll talk about this in a little bit more details. But the important uh, thing here is that uh, batch normalization, just because the distributions now are normalized, so instead of you know, uh, continuously narrowing distributions, the distributions have some standard deviation, uh, they're fatter, um, and um, so it tends to help the gradient flow all the way uh, to the earlier uh, layers. So um, this means that it's easier to train deeper networks with batch normalization. Um, it also empirically, it seems to be that batch normalization makes the network less sensitive to some hyperparameters. Uh, so we can use higher learning rates uh, and that leads to faster conversions. We're taking larger steps, right, as we're doing the gradient descent. And it also uh, tends to make the networks less sensitive to the initialization. You don't have to do so many restarts to find a good initialization for the network. Um, I talked about this uh, idea briefly of, of the shifts of the distributions between the layers, and that was the initial motivation of uh, batch normalization. Um, however, there is a work from uh, end of last year, actually mid last year, but it was in Europe last year, uh, which shows that um, the idea of shifting distributions is not, or shifting covariant shifts of distribution might not be accurate. They show that empirically, uh, and then uh, they try to argue uh, that uh, batch normalization accelerates the, the optimization process by making the landscape um, uh, essentially smoother. So you can actually look at the, so they, they look at different uh, measures of uh, um, essentially the smoothness of the gradients and how much noise there is. And they show that the landscape is a bit smoother when you use batch normalization. I'm not sure if there is an update on this picture, but that's one of the uh, ideas uh, one thing to remember, two things to remember. The first one is that uh, batch normalization is an implicit rigorizer, so it does affect the capacity of your network. Uh, I'm not, I don't think that there is an explicit way of trying to measure the impact of, of batch normalization on the capacity of the network, but it does. Um, the other thing to remember is that batch normalization behaves differently during training and test time. So during training, uh, we're using the batch statistics, the mean and the variance of the batch, to do the normalization, uh, but during test time, uh, we don't want to use that because uh, the test data set might have different statistics than what we trained on. So what we tend to do is to accumulate uh, running averages of the, of, the, uh, of the training batch and, uh, um, uh, and standard deviation and use that during test time. 
this tends to be one of the very common bugs that you have when you're dealing with batch normalization, looking at things and looking at code. Um, batch normalization uh, normalizes along the batch dimension. So it's along, if you're looking at, this is your very fat four dimensional tensor input to the network. This N is the number of examples that you have in your mini batch. Uh, batch normalization normalizes along the batch dimension. There are all sorts of other types of normalizations um, that don't normalize along the batch dimension. Layer norm, instance norm, and group norm. You can see more of this uh, in uh, this paper, crude normalization paper. Uh, the basic idea, these other types of normalizations do not depend on the batch. And uh, that's nice because we have the same normalization during uh, training and, and test time, and also helps when you're doing uh, distributed training. Um, Thorsten might talk about this on Friday. So batch normalization is for the activations in the network, and uh, data normalization is for the data itself. You don't apply, yeah. That's a good question. So the mini batch is related more than this. It's related to stochastic gradient descent, right? We mentioned yesterday that um, um, uh, the noise in the stochastic gradient descent tends to help. So most of the time, using a small, a small batch size uh, gives you um, uh, a, a model that generalizes well. However, it could be, so the, the practice is that not to use batch size larger than 32. But uh, it could be that the learning process is extremely slow with that batch size because um, you're, you have to take a small learning rate. There is a very large noise. Uh, so uh, to get beyond that, uh, you want to, uh, to increase the batch size. Beyond that, there are all sorts of things that you want to look at. And I think Thorsten will go through this on Friday. Uh, but generally, smaller batch size gives you better generalizability. Larger batch size, um, you, that's what you want to do because you want to train your model uh, faster. But there are caveats uh, on this. Um, I think I've seen things like this on Stack Overflow or something, um, but I'm not sure, I'm not, I didn't do any experiments myself, uh, and I haven't read any concrete like paper, solid papers on this topic, uh, but you can think of one thing, batch normalization is applied in the layers, in between the, the convolutional layers, or after like a block of convolutional layers, uh, dropout is applied in the classifier on the dense layers. So they're in different domains. They're not usually applied uh, after each other, at least in the networks that I have looked at. So they're in different parts of the network. It really depends. You can, uh, there are people who swear by before the activation or after the activation. The general uh, guidance is to use it before the activation because you don't wanna, you want to have the full statistics of your badge before you apply ReLU and kill all the negative uh, parts of your distribution. But there are people who show that it works better when uh, it's applied after the activation. Um, if, you're, if you're dealing with a data where, with a problem where you have uh, someone else has, has, has a network um, and uh, that shows that that network work, work well, you might want to just look at um, um, follow their example if that works for you. Okay. So... Uh, another thing that improves the performance of your network is the idea of ensembles. Uh, so the basic idea is that instead of using one version of our model um, uh, at inference time is to use multiple versions of that, an ensemble of models and then average the, uh, the results of those ensemble uh, of models. Uh, it tends to, uh, to give about 2% extra performance um, uh, in practice. This is some, an empirical uh, result. And um, so it's easy to do this when you have a shallow learning sort of model, traditional machine learning, to actually train multiple versions of your model and then average the prediction. But it could be really expensive in deep learning, especially if you're building a very uh, big model. So another way to do it is uh, to use multiple snapshots of the same model during the training process. Um, so um, you can do this in various ways, but save different checkpoints after you get to the region where you start getting satisfactory performance, you can save multiple uh, checkpoints of your uh, same model and use uh, an ensemble of checkpoints uh, to, to do the averaging. Another way is to keep a moving average of the parameters um, of the actual network parameters called Pulyak averaging. Um, uh, 
yeah, it's another way of, of doing ensemble uh, ensembles. This is, if you're applying networks in practice, you really wanna, you might want to, to test this. It gives 2%, it's not uh, trivial. Okay, so um, now I wanna move on to, in the last 20 minutes, uh, to the idea of uh, depth, uh, another issue that we have. Um, so if you look at the winners of uh, the ImageNet competition in the past since 2012, you will see a common um, uh, pattern that the number of layers that are used uh, in the winner um, uh, network, they're all deep learning networks anyway since then, uh, the number of layers has been increasing, right? So 2012 was the first winner, AlexNet was about eight layer or eight layers. And then by 2015, we have 152 layer uh, ResNet. So uh, it seems that deeper networks tend to perform uh, better. Um, this idea is related to, the, uh, to what we talked about yesterday that uh, uh, at least when right now, when we look at these, uh, what these networks are learning, they tend to learn this uh, hierarchy of features or hierarchy of filters um, that uh, when uh, uh, the, the very early layers, they learn uh, edges and blobs and then very simple motifs. And then um, as you go to deeper and deeper uh, sort of models, you can start building more, they start to activate on more abstract sort of concepts. So it seems that building um, deeper networks, it, uh, it tends to encourage the, the network to build a, another um, uh, longer hierarchy of, of filters. Um, that said, take all of that with a grain of salt. This is, again, all uh, hand wavy sort of arguments, but in practice, the important result is that deeper networks tend to perform better in practice. Uh, you can see this uh, with simple examples. So um, maybe two plots. Uh, so you can, for example, this is uh, a test of um, um, the performance of a network as the number of layers increases, and you can see that as the number of layers increase, uh, you can get a better and better performance. If you don't believe this, you wanna look at maybe because uh, the number of parameters is increasing, that's why it's performing better. However, that's not true. Because if you look at the, the accuracy on the y-axis versus the number of parameters, with um, maybe we can look at only at the blue and red. So at the same number of parameters, about 200 something million, about 200 million parameters, if you put them in um, 11 layers, you tend to get 2% or more than 2% better performance than if you put them in three layers. So you can do these sort of experiments and see that with the same number of parameters, if you reconfigure them in a deeper network, the networks tend to perform better. Now, that's the result, but in practice, uh, training deeper networks tend to be uh, uh, more challenging. Um, you can look to the left here, these are the training errors of uh, training a 56 layer network and then a 20 uh, layer network. So the training error, the, the 20 layer network tends to get much better performance than the 56 network. And if you think this is overfitting, uh, it's not actually true because even on the validation, you can see, um, uh, the same thing. So one of the reasons that training deep networks uh, is uh, difficult is what we mentioned yesterday is the vanishing gradients uh, that uh, we have to use back propagation and then uh, we're multiplying a very long uh, chain uh, of, uh, of gradients. If any of the act activations along the way and like our, our, the distributions get narrower and narrower, um, so that seems to kill the gradient and the, the gradient flow back to the early layers. Um, and sometimes you would also get exploding gradients in recurrent networks. But this idea of making, essentially making that information or the gradient updates travel all the way back to early layers um, uh, is extremely important to be able to train uh, deeper networks. Um, some people have thought about this and uh, they asked the the, um, the, the, the following question. If I have a network with this number of layers, I don't know how many layers there are here. If the, I have a network with these, this number of layers and it performs well, why if I add layers in these gaps, uh, it doesn't perform equally well? In principle, the network should be able to learn just an identity mapping, right? Should just, okay, make this identity mapping and then uh, 
and just learn, get the same performance. However, the optimization process becomes difficult, which is a part of it is the vanishing gradient that we talked about uh, earlier. So uh, the idea that they got is to use something called the gradient highway. Um, there was a paper called the gradient highway before, and this is a follow-up paper called the residual, uh, residual net, which is ResNet that we talked about. And they came up with this idea. Why don't we have the identity mapping as a part of the construction of the actual network? So instead of just having layers and layers stacked after each other, uh, try to learn, um, instead of just trying to learn the output of a block, uh, we try to learn the residual of, uh, of an output. So what we're trying to get is f of x, which is the output of this function, uh, plus uh, x. Uh, so the, this function will not try to pass the full x and learn uh, some useful features from x, uh, which is what we really want, which is s over x. It will only try to learn that residual, which is f of x. And this way, all of a sudden, we have a highway for the gradient to flow, right? So the, the gradient can flow from uh, the loss function, which is here, all the way back to much earlier layers. And uh, we can start, um, immediately people started uh, training hundreds to thousands of layers um, uh, network, just sidestepping that vanishing uh, gradient problem. Yes. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. So um, uh, I think in this, it was an, an, an element-wise addition, um, uh, but uh, there is a, a closely related concept. There are two closely related concepts, which is skip connections and uh, residual uh, uh, blocks. Skip connections, I think one of them, I, I can't remember exactly the terminology, which one, but the, uh, one of them concatenates the filters. Uh, and then if you have... Uh, yeah, it concatenates the filters, so that's great. Um, if you want to add them to each other, like you're doing here in ResNet, uh, you probably want to use one-by-one um, uh, -one convolutions to, to match the number of filters of the previous layer to the next layer and then uh, do the addition. Thank you. Okay, so what happened when this, uh, uh, when this paper came out? They won all competition, all uh, you know, sub problems in the uh, ImageNet competition in 2015 by an extremely large margin. ImageNet detection, 16% better than second, um, uh, uh, second winner, 27% on uh, object localization, and then other competitions, Coco and Coco segmentation, 11%, 12%. This is ridiculous. Okay. So this, the idea here in 2015, you know, these network, the, the already the ImageNet uh, classification with ResNet, we achieved better than um, uh, human error. So this ResNet performed better in on an unseen data set than a bunch of humans. Okay. Uh, the images are not, they're, um, they're, they're 128, they're lower resolution pixels and uh, they are taken in real, uh, with real lightning and real, all sorts of real life conditions um, that it can actually be confusing uh, to people. Uh, I'm not sure how exactly the human um, uh, uh, test is performed, um, but um, if like, there's time uh, you know, constraint or something, uh, but there is a, a there is an, an irreducible human error here. Okay, so um, I don't have time to actually talk about this. Um, I just wanted to mention that uh, uh, you might think that the idea of uh, uh, this idea of skip connections or high, gradient highways has actually enabled, um, uh, has resolved the entire problem of, of uh, vanishing gradients. But there are, uh, but there is another way to look at it. It has actually um, shorten the effective pathway from the loss function all the way to early layers. Uh, if you are interested in this, you can look at this paper. Uh, so essentially, you can see that the effective pathway from the very early on to from the loss function to uh, to early layers is about 19 layers um, instead of the the entire stack um, of layers that you have. I want to touch on a couple of uh, uh, topics. Actually, maybe one topic. Before we finish, uh, transfer learning. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a talk on transfer learning um, for reasons the speaker couldn't uh, make it. And this is a very important topic um, in practice when you're uh, training neural networks, 
um, uh, there is uh, one, you always, we don't always have uh, millions of images or millions of data or labeled data sets to be able to train ResNet from scratch. Um, and you also don't have the time or the computational resources to be able to do this from scratch. Training ResNet, uh, I think on ImageNet takes, on a single, a good single GPU takes about 10 days. Um, so, and if you're doing this in practice, you'll never get that paper out. So, um, uh, so we use something called the transfer learning. Um, and there is a, a, a close concept to this, which is called also um, a domain adaptation, that you might be uh, training on, uh, on a certain data set, but in reality, we are applying your network on a slightly different domain or slightly different data set than the, the training data set. Um, so how do you actually deal with that problem of domain adaptation? It's a closely related uh, topic, uh, and it's very important in practice. So uh, just a reminder of uh, what uh, um, uh, Brenda showed yesterday, the difference between machine learning and deep learning is that in, in traditional machine learning, we can think of it, this is one of the differences, this is not like the, uh, you know, everything that is there to say about this, um, is that in traditional machine learning, we do feature extraction by hand, and then we apply a classifier uh, network uh, or a classifier whatever model, uh, SVM, or it could be a shallow neural network or whatever it is, and then we get our output. In deep learning, we're doing uh, this end-to-end. -end. So uh, our neural network uh, does both the feature extraction and the classification. So all of that, those convolutional layers that we had in our network, those are feature extractors. And then um, the, uh, uh, the dense layers are uh, uh, the classifiers. Um, so uh, the idea of transfer learning is that when you're going from, um, you have a, you, have, you want to train on a small data set or a slightly big data set, but it's not large enough to train the entire uh, ResNet or entire BGG network or something, uh, is to reuse those feature extractors. So essentially, you, take, you get a pre-trained neural network, you keep the convolutional layers because these are feature extractors. You think they're useful features, they build hierarchy of, of concepts and abstract uh, stuff. And then you retrain uh, the, the classifier, you retrain the last layers, which is these three layers. If you don't have a lot of uh, data, you could train only the very last one. If you have a little bit more of data, you can train two of these. You can might be able to train the three of them if you have a larger data set. Um, using pre-trained network, you can also fine tune um, your, you can also fine tune uh, your feature extractors, which is, the, the, um, the convolutional layers if you want, and you have data enough to do that. And this is very useful in practice. In fact, there's this slide in CS231 that says that transfer learning is pervasive. It's actually the norm, not the exception. In reality, you don't want, you have an idea, you're sitting down uh, with your friend, you wanna test it, um, you know, after lunch, you wanna go and test it. You're not gonna just, you know, spend um, uh, 10 days to test a, a very simple idea. Right, um, so what you would want to do is to, you wanna get results by the end of the day, right? So you go and you use transfer learning. Um, and this is done everywhere. In practice, this is what people do. And in Keras, um, the framework you looked at yesterday, it's very easy to do this. It's just one line to get a pre-trained network. Any of these networks, you can get them in one line. Um, and then removing parts of, uh, of the networks is also super easy. Um, in practice, there is a paper that showed last year that is this extremely necessary? Um, and the answer is no. If you have enough data set, uh, you don't really need to get to the same accuracy that you would get with a pre-trained network. Um, you don't need uh, to, uh, to use transfer learning. So essentially, this, the two curves here, this is the, the accuracy of a, mo of a ResNet model. Uh, the two curves are uh, the, in magenta is the random initialization. In gray is with pre-training, pre -training, which is the transfer learning. Uh, you can see if you have enough time, you're, you know, have nothing to do, and then uh, you have enough data set, you will get the same accuracy. However, if you don't have enough time, um, the pre-trained network tends to get to a much, uh, to a better accuracy much faster um, than uh, the randomly initialized one. 
Uh, and if you don't have data set, you don't have an option anyway. You have to use pre uh, transfer learning. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the gray curve, I actually don't remember. I read this paper last year, end of last year. <laughs> uh, so, but uh, that's a good question. I, I think they retrain only the last uh, dense layer. And I think in ResNet, in this particular ResNet, there's only one last dense layer. Um, and they don't, you, they don't fine tune the convolutional layers. Or it could be that uh, whatever batch size is still much less than the, the maximum batch size that you can use. This is related to the paper that was mentioned this morning, the opening eye, that as the, as the training uh, goes on and you get to smoother parts of the loss function, you can use much, much larger batch sizes uh, as long as there is a ceiling to that where they do some derivation to show the maximum batch size, but it tends to be very, very high uh, ceiling. Oh, that's the learning rate decay. That's a good point. So uh, you remember we were talking about the learning rate decay very early on. Um, so these are the points where you decay the learning rate and then you jump. So these jumps are the same as these jumps. Uh, I think this is uh, the learning rate decay. I know because this, this curve here. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah, I, I need to relook at the paper. Um, I think um, I, I, um, I vaguely remember that uh, if this, these are different places where you could decide to stop the, the training and then you do fine tuning, uh, some fine tuning uh, schedule. So these are different possibilities for how to, uh, where to stop the training and doing some fine tuning of the entire network. Um, Sorry, I shouldn't present papers that I have read six months ago, so. Um, okay, so uh, two other topics that are important in practice, hyperparameter optimization. Uh, we've talked, we mentioned so many hyperparameters that we have in these neural networks and you, might, you want a way to do that hyperparameter optimization. There's a talk tomorrow by Ben Albrecht, I think he's here. Um, and then uh, please, um, uh, hopefully you'll be there for that. You'll talk about uh, the difference between doing uh, grid search and random search, and also um, maybe some other like optimization methods like Bayesian optimization and other methods. And he will also show um, uh, how to do that with a particular framework. There are frameworks uh, to do this. Um, you might want to look at uh, when you're doing, if you don't have a lot of time to do hyperparameter optimization, uh, there are a few parameters that are extremely important uh, to tune. Uh, the first one is the learning rate, especially if you're not using Adam. If you're not using Adam, you probably, Adam is less sensitive to the exact value of the learning rate. Um, but if you're not using Adam, you probably want to do at least learning rate um, uh, tuning. And you want to do that using random search rather than grid search because this is wasteful. Um, you will hear more about this tomorrow. Uh, a couple of training tips. Um, we talked about a lot of, uh, we talked about things like uh, the initialization and uh, how the initialization can, uh, can prevent the learning if you have the wrong initialization. And the reason, the way that we at least illustrated that, we showed the distributions of the different activations. It turns out that in practice, when you're actually doing uh, debugging your model and trying to find out why it's not working, uh, this is a very good way of actually finding out you know, are things at least, is there a learning impediment somewhere? Is there uh, some, a lot of zero activations? If you're using ReLU, for example, it could be that the network needs to have some leaky ReLU to, uh, to pass back uh, so the gradients. Um, so the way to, to actually find out about all of these problems is to, to, to monitor the activation distribu the activations distributions. Um, yeah, I, um, I didn't have time to actually find plots for this, so sorry. Um, another thing that you might want to look at is to uh, watch the, the update scales for your weights. So you can, uh, this is not correct. This is just the monitor the update scales, which is the gradients uh, divided by the weights. So you want your gradients divided by the weights to be somewhere between one uh, to um, uh, one part in a thousand to uh, one percent uh, of the ways. This is just a rule of thumb, but you really want to see that your the the the, the updates are not much larger or extremely large; that they are overwhelming the ways and then thwarting the whole uh, thing off. That's another um, thing that is very useful to monitor in practice. 
Another way is towards the end of your training, you want to see if your network, this is good enough and this has worked. Um, uh, one way of, uh, of find, uh, you know, inspecting um, uh, the quality of the final network that you have is to visualize the weights of uh, the first layer. Um, if your weights are uh, like this, they're crisp clear, they're very, they're, it's very clear that they have very nice edges, they're activators and filters here. Uh, this is where you want to be. If you have, um, um, if you have this type of, uh, uh, visual, you know, visuals or, or of your, or your first layer weights, uh, this could be an indication that you either haven't converged or um, there might be problem with your um, uh, weight regularization. So that's another way to inspect problems in your models. There are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of, uh, uh, yep, yeah, okay. There are a lot of uh, um, such, uh, you know, tips that uh, I think they're really, really useful uh, to look at. Uh, Andre Karpathy um, has compiled um, a large number of them uh, last April, um, and I encourage you to look at this, um, uh, at this blog post and actually think about each one of them, why it makes sense uh, to do that. Why, uh, why is it useful to do that? You, will you have to equip yourself with as many of these uh, diagnostic uh, uh, tools as possible to be able to debug these networks um, faster. Um, that's it. Do you have any questions?